The point is, anybody who can hurt you can be put into play. In this episode, we are summarizing the 12th episode from Season 1 of the Wire series titled Cleaning Up. The episode first aired on September 1st, 2002. In the beginning, during his visit to the Low Rise Projects, Stringer Bell takes the pagers of the entire crew, which includes individuals such as D'Angelo Barksdale, Bodie, Pooh, Manny, Cass, and Sterling. He then provides Bodie and D'Angelo with mobile phones and three contact numbers, instructing them that the phones can be used to schedule meetings, but all discussions related to the business must now take place in person. This minor alteration in the way the Barksdale crew operates is a crucial scene in The Wire because it shows just how the police are almost always one step behind of the criminals. In this scene, we see just how quickly the crew can adapt to threats, much like private companies in the private sector. The police departments, however, are part of the public sector, and as a result of the multiple layers of bureaucracy, can only ever adapt to change slowly and after multiple levels of approval. During a meeting with their lawyer, Maurice Levi, Avon Barksdale and Stringer are advised to take action as they have come to know about the ongoing investigation against them. Levi suggests that they should distance themselves from Orlando's club since he may have already disclosed information to the police before he died. To determine when the problem began, Levi asks about how their issue began, and Stringer points out that it was during the time of D'Angelo's trial. Levi also indicates that Nakisha Lyles could be a source of trouble. After Levi leaves, Stringer convinces Avon to limit his direct communication with their crew by having all information pass through him. D'Angelo joins Avon and Stringer at the club where they inquire about Wallace's whereabouts. D'Angelo informs them that Wallace has quit the game. D'Angelo pleads with Avon to spare Wallace and then leaves. Later on, Wallace returns from the countryside and requests his former position back. Bodhi suggests he accept a lower rank, but D'Angelo overrules him and advises Wallace on how to handle his return. Afterwards, D'Angelo's mother, Brianna, arrives at the pit and she brings lunch for D'Angelo. This gesture just goes to show how supported the Barksdale boys have been by their own entire family from the beginning. Although D'Angelo's mother knows exactly what he is doing, and how he is helping to destroy his own community, this does not stop his mother from bringing food while he is selling drugs, showing the viewer how the public sector agencies like the police departments are as inept as the parents who raise the criminals themselves. As McNulty arrives at the detail office, he finds Lester Freeman fitting Chardine with contact lenses. Freeman informs McNulty that their surveillance is deteriorating because the Barksdale organization is altering its modus operandi. In response, Freeman has sent Detective Prez out of town to follow the paper trail. Freeman proposes that they equip Chardine with a wire and send her to Avon's club for information gathering purposes. During a meeting with Deputy Commissioner Burrell and Major Bobby Reed, Daniels discusses his ongoing investigation. Burrell seems to think that the case has come to an end since the wiretaps are no longer working. However, Daniels argues that they still have some time left on the court order so they should continue the surveillance. Birel then orders Daniels to return Detective Santangelo and Sidnor and to reduce the size of his team. However, he allows him to retain Freeman and Prez Belusky. Daniels is content with this decision since both Freeman and Prez have been valuable assets to him throughout the entire investigation. As we catch up with ASA Rhonda Perlman, she has a meeting with the state's attorney who expresses concerns about the ongoing Barksdale investigation and its potential implications on campaign donations. He provides Perlman with evidence of returned contributions from unidentifiable sources that had come from his own offices and asks her to deliver it to the detail. Perlman is upset that her superiors are anxious about her investigation since it reflects poorly on her. She denies any knowledge of the detail's actions. She says that because the records are public, no one ever requested her help. As we catch up with Chardine, she is wearing a wire and she tries to gather useful information by infiltrating the office at the club, but her efforts proved to be unsuccessful. Later that night, some police officers discover the lifeless body of Nakisha Lyles. Bunk informs the Barksdale detail about the murder and they fear for Wallace's safety. Daniels quickly mobilizes his team to locate Wallace. Freeman offers Chardine a place to stay at his apartment. Daniels attends a meeting with Burrell and Senator Clay Davis, who is apprehensive about the details investigation into his campaign finances and his driver's involvement. 
Daniels declines to apologize for the driver's arrest and informs the senator that if he has nothing to hide, he has nothing to worry about. Davis reveals that he has no knowledge of the source of his campaign contributions. Daniels departs from the meeting and Davis urges Burrell to keep Daniels under control. Remember, I am summarizing the entire series, so subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss the next episode. I will be reviewing other TV shows and movies in the future as well. To see the episode summaries for my other shows, click on the playlist in the description. Drop a comment below of your favorite scene from this episode. Upon Daniel's return to the office, Herc expresses his joy for passing his sergeant's exam. Meanwhile, Carver is away for in-service training and is not as fortunate. Sidnor calls from the shore to report that Wallace has been missing for two days. ASA Perlman arrives at the details office to question Daniels about the investigation into campaign donations. As we catch up with Bodie, he receives a call and heads to the towers where he meets up with Stringer. Stringer inquires about Wallace and Bodie informs him that Wallace has returned. Stringer asks Bodie for his opinion of Wallace and Bodie describes him as weak. After hearing this, Stringer orders Bodie to take out Wallace once and for all. After Bodhi informs Pooh of his orders, Pooh suggests that Wallace is using drugs and therefore unreliable as an informant. Bodhi argues that even if Wallace is using, he is still unreliable and has to go. He also notes that if they do not follow Stringer's orders, they will be out of the business. And Wallace's death is just part of the game. Wallace brings food for the children he is taking care of, but later goes out for dinner with Bodhi and Pooh. When they come back, they discover that the kids are gone. Bodhi, Pooh, and Wallace end up going to Wallace's room and here they take him out for being an informant. The following day, Avon shows up to vacate his office at Orlando's club and the investigative team is disappointed for being one step behind yet again. To ensure that the discovery of Wallace's corpse is made, Pooh arranges for his girlfriend to report a dead animal in Wallace's apartment. Bunk investigates the scene and confirms that it is indeed Wallace's body. As Avon empties his office, he instructs D'Angelo to drive to New York to collect their next shipment, emphasizing that he trusts him because he is family. Using this knowledge, McNulty and Daniels borrow a tracking device from the FBI and they plant it on D'Angelo's car while he changes clothes. After being stopped by traffic police, D'Angelo is brought in by the detail and interrogated by McNulty and Daniels without a lawyer present. D'Angelo is of course cautious since he has been deceived by McNulty in the past. McNulty informs D'Angelo about Wallace's death but he remains skeptical and does not believe him at first. Avon is criticized by Brianna for allowing D'Angelo to be arrested. Later, Stringer Bell and Levi meet with D'Angelo who is fixed on asking about Wallace's whereabouts. Stringer avoids the question multiple times causing D'Angelo to become furious when he realizes that McNulty was telling the truth about Wallace's death all along. In a fit of rage, D'Angelo then refuses to be represented by Levi. Daniels meets with Burrell to discuss the recent arrest of D'Angelo and Burrell suggests that this arrest should be enough to end the case. However, Daniels believes that they can get more information from D'Angelo if they apply pressure at this point. Burrell questions the relevance of Daniels' team investigating campaign finances yet again and Burrell ends up threatening Daniels with the FBI report on his excessive personal funds spending from before. Despite the threat, Daniels refuses to go back and says he will continue with the case as long as he has time on the wiretap affidavit. He even goes as far as to threaten Burrell, saying that he's willing to take the fall for the Eastern District allegations, which he believes will eventually come to light, and that Burrell is most afraid of the negative press it will generate on him and his administration. In this scene, we see how corrupt institutions are often guided by corrupt individuals precisely because they are corrupt and are subject to being manipulated and influenced. It is precisely because Daniels has some dirt on him that he is placed in charge of leading this investigation into the biggest drug dealer in Baltimore. Burrell feels like he can control him. However, we see this is not the case. McNulty and Daniels end up observing the SWAT team getting ready to apprehend Avon. McNulty suggests that they should make the arrest themselves and they go in. Daniels arrests Avon while McNulty allows Stringer to escape, telling him they will catch him later. Back at the office, Freeman, Prez, and Sidnor review their evidence board and add a newspaper article about a rehab center being built in an area where the Barksdale crew 
has been acquiring property. Sidnor expresses his satisfaction with their work, but he still feels like they have more to do. Meanwhile, at the low rises, the dealer's orange sofa remains unused. I feel like I don't have that many people around me I could really trust. That was episode number 12, titled Cleaning Up. To watch the next or previous episode summary, click on the link in the description or at the end of this video. To see every episode summary I have made, click on the playlists linked in the description. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter for additional content. If you can, please support us on Patreon. It really goes a long way toward helping us grow this channel. I will see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Where's Wallace at? Where's the boy, Strain? We upload new videos every week, so subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to hit the like button as well. Click the notification bell to be notified of when we upload these videos. See you on the next episode of Culture Screen.